In today's lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of offline reinforcement learning, and we'll cover more uh, modern offline RL algorithms based on value function estimation that take explicit steps to mitigate the ill effects of distributional shift. So first, to briefly recap from Monday, on policy reinforcement learning algorithms are algorithms that interact with the world, collect a little bit of data, use that data to update the model, then discard that data and collect more data. Off-policy RL algorithms, which we learned about before, are essentially a buffered version of this, where all the data that is collected so far is stored in a replay buffer and is uh, used for each update. So you, can, you might load all the transitions to augment the amount of data available for each update for something like a Q function. But you still iteratively collect additional data with the latest policy that you have. Offline reinforcement learning dispenses with active data collection entirely. In offline reinforcement learning, we assume that we are given a data set and that that data set was collected by some unknown behavior policy, which we denote with pi beta. So the definitions are D is our data set, which we can think of as just an unordered set of state action, next state, and reward tuples. In practice, those tuples are typically arranged into trajectories, but value-based methods of the sort that we will describe in today's lecture generally do not make use of this, so they just assume that you're given transitions. We will use a D with a superscript pi beta to denote a state distribution, uh, or D superscript pi theta for the current policy state distribution. Uh, pi beta represents the behavior policy, the policy that collected the data set. In general, we don't know this, what this is. We have our transition probabilities, our rewards, and the behavior policy, you know, it could really be anything. It could be uh, humans collecting data, it could be a hand-designed controller. So we just assume that something like it exists, which is uh, not really assuming anything at all. So if you see the simple pi beta, basically in most of these algorithms, uh, we'll either only use samples from pi beta, or if we need access to the probabilities, we will fit some model to estimate those probabilities. Our objective, just like before, is to maximize expected reward. And as we learned on Monday, a major problem with using value-based methods, like Q-learning style methods, is the problem of distributional shift. So for any kind of method that uses a Q function, whether it's actor critic or Q learning, the Q function needs to be fitted to its target values using the data. And when the data isn't changing, then the objective for fitting the Q functions is the Bellman error in expectation under the behavior policy. And this expectation is approximated by using the samples in D. What this means is that our Q function can be expected to provide accurate estimates in expectation under pi beta. The problem is that when we perform Bellman backups, we use estimates of the expected value of the Q function under our latest policy, pi nu. We would expect good accuracy if pi nu is equal to pi beta, but that's usually not the case because the whole point is to get pi nu to improve over, fi, over pi beta. So we experience distributional shift, which means that our estimates of the Q values under pi nu will not be very accurate. The situation is further exacerbated by the fact that pi nu is directly selected to maximize the expected value of the Q function, which means in a sense that pi nu is strongly incentivized to find kind of adversarial actions that will fool the Q function into outputting erroneously large Q values. And that is in fact exactly what we see happening in practice uh, as shown in the plots in the lower right, where the actual reward of policies trained with offline RL using standard, in this case, Q function actor critic methods is very low, but the Q function estimates that the return will be extremely high. So the Y axis in the rightmost plot is a log scale uh, where the red curve, which gets a reward of negative 250, has estimated Q values that are 10 to the seventh power. So what all this means is that if we want to develop practical deep offline RL algorithms, we need to somehow solve this distributional shift problem. So how do uh, current and prior methods typically address this? Well, one very widely studied class of methods is what I'm going to refer to as policy constraint methods. Uh, these are methods that adopt some sort of actor critic structure, and they're going to update their Q function with an expected value under pi nu, but they will modify the policy update to not just maximize the Q values, but also impose some sort of constraint. For example, a constraint that the KL divergence between pi and pi beta should be bounded by epsilon. Uh, 
So in principle, this should solve distributional shift, right? Because if you choose epsilon to be small enough, then um, in principle, you should not get too many erroneous values. And that's the idea, at least. Um, I, I will to sort of give away the punchline. I'll, I'll say right away that while policy constraint methods provide good tools for analysis and kind of a reasonable basis to start with, uh, generally the best performing current methods do something a little more sophisticated. So uh, typically just policy constraint methods implemented naively don't actually work all that well. Uh, but it is a very old idea. Uh, as far as I could tell, it doesn't have a single name, but it, can, it comes up in work by Emmanuel Todoro from the early 2000s, work by Bert Kappen, uh, trust regions, covariant policy gradients, natural policy gradients. They all make use of some kind of constrained actor update idea. And also you, this idea has been used in a number of recent papers uh, from uh, Fox et al., Fujimoto, uh, Jax, uh, Kumar, and Wu, and many others. So it's a, it's a very well-studied idea that goes back many decades. But it has a number of issues if applied naively. One obvious issue is that we usually don't know what the behavior policy is. Uh, and that means that uh, we have to be very careful when estimating the KL divergence term. So the, the data could have come from humans. It could have come from a hand-designed controller. It could have come from many past RL runs. So it could be a mixture policy or even a combination of all of the above. In practice, what this means is that if we want to employ a policy constraint method of this sort, we need to either fit a, another model with behavioral cloning to estimate pi beta, or we need to be very clever in how we implement the constraint so that we can get away with only samples from pi beta without having to have access to its probabilities. And both of those are viable options. And I'll say right now that the latter actually tends to work a lot better than the former, but um, they can both uh, be reasonable choices. There's a second issue, which is actually a little bit more severe, which is that for many choices of this constraint, this approach can be both too pessimistic and not pessimistic enough. I'll describe this a little bit more later, but basically the reasoning here is the following. Remember how when we talked about distributional shift, we asked, well, what if x star, the test point, is sampled from p of x? Do we expect low error then? The answer is usually no, because if we're minimizing error in expectation, we can only expect it to be low in expectation. So in general, you could have two distributions that are very close together in terms of uh, standard divergence metrics like KL divergence, and still have highly erroneous predictions uh, for samples from your new policy. Uh, more precisely, this imposes a kind of a constant trade-off between staying close enough to pi beta to not experience too many errors and deviating enough from pi beta to improve the policy substantially. But then there's this other part about being too pessimistic. The issue is that at the same time, we'd like to intuitively find the best policy that is kind of inside the support of the data. We'd like to say, well, the data tells us about what is possible, and we'd like to pick good stuff within the, the set of what is possible. And a, a naive constraint like, like a KL divergence constraint can actually prevent us from doing that. Imagine that pi beta is uniformly random, which means that uh, essentially uh, any action is equally likely, which means that no action is out, of, is out of distribution. A KL divergence constraint in this case would tell us that pi should remain uh, maximally random. And that doesn't really make sense. Like, why should we make pi more random just because pi beta was more random? So while this framework seems very reasonable, it actually in practice doesn't lead to such great results for these reasons. Uh, but let's talk about it a little bit more. So first, what kind of constraints can we use? Um, there are a number of choices. The most straightforward choice implementation-wise is to use a KL divergence constraint because this kind of constraint has a convenient functional form that makes it fairly easy to write it down, to differentiate it, and to optimize it. So it's easy to implement, uh, but it's not necessarily what we want. Uh, and I alluded to this a little bit on the previous slide, but let me explain it a little bit more with a picture. So let's say that this pi beta is our policy, and I'm visualizing it here. You can imagine this in a single state. So for different actions, it has different probabilities, and you can see that it has fairly good coverage of these actions in the middle. And let's say that these orange dots represent samples in our data set, and the y-axis here for the orange dots corresponds to their q-value. So just from looking at these dots, you can see that that really tall uh, dot, the, the second one from the left, that must correspond to a pretty good action. 
So if we're just seeing this, we probably want to take the action corresponding to that second dot from the left because it's so much better than all the others. If we were to fit a Q function to this by you know, minimizing the difference to the target values, we might get a curve that looks a little bit like this orange one. Now you'll notice that in regions that have a low probability under pi beta, here on the right, the Q function will attempt to extrapolate and its extrapolated values are probably quite unreliable. So even though the largest values that it takes on are actually over there on the right, we probably don't want to trust those values because uh, they are far out of distribution. And we might say that the values here in the middle are maybe more reliable. Although remember what I said before, that in general, you're not guaranteed to have low, uh, low error even for in-distribution actions. You're only guaranteed low error in expectation. But nonetheless, we might surmise that the values are more reliable here in the middle. If we train a new policy pi that maximizes the Q values and minimizes uh, the divergence to pi beta, we might get something like this green curve. Notice that the, the green curve doesn't concentrate entirely on the good action because it is forced to stay somewhat close to pi beta. So if we were to reduce the variance further, if we were to tighten up that green curve around that really good action, we would increase the KL divergence to pi beta and perhaps violate our constraint. So this, is, this might be the best policy we can get under our constraint. But notice that this policy does still assign pretty high value, pretty high probability, even to actions with a very low value on the tails. It does assign the highest probability to the best action, but it still assigns high probability to some pretty bad actions. Intuitively, what we want is something like this, this other curve, this uh, darker green curve, which really only assigns high probability to the really good actions and falls off much more rapidly. But this uh, better policy might violate our KL divergence constraint because it re reduces the variance too much. So this might be the best in-support policy, meaning the best policy that only assigns high probabilities to actions that had high probabilities of pi beta, but it might violate our KL divergence constraint. So based on this intuition, what we might choose to do instead is to employ a support constraint. A support constraint basically means that um, you're only going to give uh, actions uh, non-trivial probability. There's a typo here that, that first inequality should be a greater than sign. So pi a given s is greater than zero, uh, only for actions where pi beta has a probability that's greater than or equal to some threshold epsilon. And that's kind of a crude way to write a support constraint. And of course, in reality, uh, it's very difficult to enforce this exactly as written, but there are various approximations uh, that we can employ. One common choice is to use something like a maximum mean discrepancy uh, estimator, and that can crudely estimate a support constraint. Now, the trouble with these is that they're in general significantly more complex to implement. So KL divergences are very easy to evaluate. Things like MMD are more complicated, uh, but it's generally much closer to what we really want. So this is a very high level summary, but hopefully this just gives you a taste for what kind of trade-offs we have to make when we're deciding on these constraints. And a lot of what I'll talk about next actually does deal with KL divergence constraints because they're so much easier to work with. But I just want to emphasize that they do have some pretty fundamental shortcomings when it comes to actual practical offline RL methods. If you want to learn more about the details, here are three papers that I might recommend. Uh, the first one is a survey review paper, and the other two discuss various kinds of constraints. And I would encourage you to check out those papers if you want to learn a lot more about these. Uh, most of our discussion today will focus on the, on the simpler types of constraints. Okay, how do we implement constraints? I'll talk about kind of a, a high-level overview of methods that enforce constraints explicitly. Then I'll do a deep dive into methods that enforce constraints implicitly, which can be very effective and simple in practice. And then I'll talk about a few other approaches. Uh, but first, let's talk about some explicit approaches. I will say right away, these are generally not the methods that work well, but it's good to be aware of how they work um, to better contextualize some of the other things I'll cover. So a very simple way to do this is to directly modify the actor objective. So in a conventional actor critic algorithm with a Q function, our actor objective would basically be this, maximize the expected value uh, under the policy of the Q values where the states are sampled from the data set. Now let's write down the form of the KL divergence between pi and pi beta. I know I said before the KL divergence is not a great choice, but it is simple, so it's much easier to uh, discuss this first. The KL divergence between pi and pi beta is just the expected value under pi of log pi minus log pi beta, which we can also write uh, as the negative of the expected value of log pi beta minus the entropy of pi. 
Now notice that there is a close similarity between this equation and the actor objective I have written above, in that both of them are expected values under pi, although the KL divergence also has this additional entropy term. So what I can do is I can incorporate the KL divergence into the actor objective. The log pi beta term simply gets added to the Q values because it doesn't depend on pi, and then I have this additional entropy term. Both of them are multiplied by a Lagrange multiplier lambda. Remember that if we have a constrained optimization problem, uh, you know, uh, maximize f of x subject to c of x equals zero, we can write it as an unconstrained problem where the constraint is multiplied by a Lagrange multiplier. So if we can find the value of this Lagrange multiplier, then solving this problem will actually enforce the constraint. And in practice, we can either use the dual gradient descent approach that we covered before to find lambda, or we can even treat lambda as a hyperparameter and just tune the value of lambda directly. So this, uh, so here, uh, lambda is our Lagrange multiplier, and h is the entropy, which is very easy to compute in closed form and differentiate for either Gaussian or categorical policies. So the entropy term is actually very easy to deal with. You literally just code up the formula for the entropy and then let your automatic differentiation software uh, compute the gradients. And then the log pi beta term is simply added to the q function. Now, you do need to know what log pi beta is, which means that in practice, if your data comes from some unknown policy, you would do something like behavioral cloning to fit pi beta in order to allow you to estimate this. And that can be quite difficult, actually. Another approach uh, to uh, enforcing these constraints is to instead directly modify the reward function. So you can simply subtract a penalty from the reward, uh, depending on the, uh, you know, which is determined by the divergence of your choice, such as KL divergence or MMD or anything else. Um, this, has, this works a little bit differently. So it's a simple modification to directly penalize divergence that forces the policy to basically deal with it. It also accounts for future divergence, so it'll actually have a slightly different effect because now the policy will avoid actions that incur a large divergence now. It'll also avoid actions that have a low divergence now but lead to higher divergence later. And that can actually be quite desirable in many cases. Um, so this approach has slightly different theoretical properties and can actually work better. Um, so for more on this, check out this paper. Uh, but generally, from my experience, both approaches don't really work all that well, and there are actually better ways to do this. Um, so generally, the best modern offline RL methods don't do either of these things. One approach that removes the need to explicitly estimate pi beta is to use what are called implicit policy constraints. So here's our constraint optimization again, and I'm going to use a KL divergence constraint for now to keep it simple. It turns out that if you write down the Lagrangian of this problem uh, and uh, actually solve for the closed form solution for the optimal policy, you get this equation. It's straightforward to show via Lagrangian duality. Uh, I won't go through the derivation on this slide because I have a lot to cover in today's lecture, um, but uh, you can check out a few uh, prior papers that derive this. This is actually a very widely studied th um, idea. There's a work by Peters et al. called REPS, a work by Rollick et al. called Scilearning, that all basically derive the same thing. Essentially what this equation is saying is that the optimal solution to this constrained optimization problem above is given by the behavior policy multiplied by the exponential of the advantage function divided by a Lagrange multiplier lambda. Now, uh, if we dissect a little bit what this means, it's actually, in my opinion, actually somewhat intuitive. If um, lambda goes to uh, zero, then that means that the advantage is multiplied by infinity, and the only thing that is proportional to the exponential of that is a greedy policy that assigns a probability of one to the action that maximizes the advantage and zero to everything else. But for finite values of lambda, essentially what this is doing is it's making suboptimal actions exponentially less likely, but also multiplying them by, by pi beta. So any action that has a very low probability on, under pi beta, even if it has a very high advantage, will end up with a very low probability. Uh, and then lambda has to be chosen as a Lagrange multiplier to satisfy that constraint. But as I mentioned before, uh, lambda can also be treated directly as a hyperparameter of the algorithm and just tuned based on the desired performance. Now, of course, directly creating the functional form of pi star here requires knowing pi beta. So we haven't actually done anything to simplify our problem yet. But looking at this equation, one of the things we can recognize is that we can approximate 
pi star here by using samples from pi beta. Because anytime that you want some quantity, which is given by the product of a distribution and some other stuff, uh, well, expected values under the distribution actually give you basically exactly that. So you can approximate the solution via weighted max likelihood. So to train pi nu, uh, what you can do is you can sample from pi beta, so that gives you the pi beta term in pi star, multiply that sample by a weight corresponding to all the other terms in the equation, put that weight on the sample, and then maximize the likelihood on that sample with that weight. So the loss function you're seeing here is basically the behavior cloning loss. That's why the log pi shows up in there, except the samples are weighted by all the other terms in the equation above, which is 1 over z times the exponential of 1 over lambda times the advantage. So in practice, what you would do is you would uh, generate samples from the data set. So this is, these are basically, uh, this is basically the data set you're given. Use the critic to get the advantage, and that gives you a weight. And you can put that weight on every sample from the data set and then just uh, do a weighted max likelihood, essentially weighted behavioral cloning, where the weights are given by uh, the advantage function, and the advantage com function comes from your critic. This has some interesting implications, because one of the things that this suggests is that a constrained, critic up is a constrained actor update really just corresponds to a kind of weighted behavior cloning, where the weights depend on how good the actions are. So what this algorithm is really doing is it's imitating the actions in your data set but it's imitating the good actions more than the bad actions. And the, the math shows that that actually corresponds to solving this constrained uh, actor objective. So if you want to implement this in practice, you would create a critic loss, which is just the regular Q function critic uh, that we had in the actor critic discussion. And you would have an actor loss, which is this weighted maximum likelihood. And then you would alternate between taking gradient steps on the critic loss and taking gradient steps on the actor loss. Um, so this essentially implements the constrained actor critic framework that I showed before using this implicit constraint trick, meaning that it doesn't actually require you to know the functional form of pi beta. It only requires you to have samples from it, which is what you have in your data set. Um, so this algorithm uh, uh, with uh, Q function estimation goes under the name of advantage weighted actor critic or awake. Uh, if you use Monte Carlo returns, which is also possible, you can get an algorithm called advantage weighted regression. And the citations, if you want to read more about this, are shown at the bottom of this slide. Now, uh, the trouble with this kind of approach, uh, well, let me rewind a little bit. The trouble with this kind of approach is that in order to estimate those advantage values, you do still need to query out of distribution actions uh, because there's, there's no guarantee that at intermediate stages in training, your policy pi theta will perfectly respect the constraint. If you choose lambda appropriately, the constraint will be respected at convergence, but over the course of training, the constraint may not be respected, which means that you can still get out of distribution actions with this. Um, so there's actually two places uh, where you end up querying out of distribution actions. One is in the target value where you're computing the expectation under pi theta. So as I said, at convergence, pi theta should obey the constraint, but it may not obey the constraint over the course of training. And also when you're estimating the advantage, that's again Q minus the expected value of Q under pi theta. So that also requires uh, querying actions from pi theta uh, into the Q function. And both of those can have errors. Can we actually avoid that? Can we somehow avoid all out of distribution action queries uh, when computing uh, the, the target values? Well, here's the target value computation. And Let's say that this um, the second term, that's v of s prime. Okay, so that that's the value, ideally the value for pi nu. But let's just say it's just another neural network. Well, we can train this neural network with some loss function. So we could take, for example, all the sampled state action tuples in our data set and regress v of s i onto q of s i a i using some loss function, like for example a mean squared error loss. Now that won't really work because when you do this. V of, S is, v of S i is going to match Q of S i a i, but a i in the data set comes from pi beta, not from pi nu. So you're actually estimating the value of pi beta, not of uh, pi nu. So this is not really going to work. It's going to give you the Q function of the behavior policy, not of your latest policy, because the action comes from pi beta. But now here's a funny thought. 
if you consider all the trajectories that you have in the data set, and you look at one of the states along those trajectories, well, in that state, there was probably only one action that you ever saw. You know, the state was probably only visited once, if you have a continuous value state or a very large state space. But there may be other states nearby uh, that are similar where a different action was taken. So because of that, in reality, when you're regressing onto QSIAI at a state SI, the target for this value function consists of a distribution. It consists of a distribution over different values. Even in the case where you've only seen one action in a single state, you've probably seen other actions in other similar states. So insofar as your value function network generalizes, it really has a distribution of values. And what I'm showing here is basically a histogram of that. So for different values, for different uh, targets, they have a different probability. This, this distribution is induced only by the actions. And if you use a mean squared error loss, what the mean squared error loss actually estimates is the expected value with respect to this distribution, where the expectation is taken under pi beta. But what if we don't try to estimate the expected value? What if we instead try to estimate an upper quantile or um, what well, we're actually going to use something called an expectile, but an expectile is just like a quantile only with a squared error. So you can think of an upper quantile of this distribution as essentially the value of the best policy supported by the data. So it's kind of like saying, you know, in all the states that you visited that are similar to the state, what was the best value that you saw? So here's a question. If the mean squared error loss gives us the expected value under this distribution, is there some other loss that gives us something like an upper quantile? Basically, could we still use SIAI, but just change the form of the loss function and get something that looks more like this, the, the upper end of this histogram? So we can use something called an expectile loss. Um, the equation for an expectile loss might look a little bit messy, but there's actually pretty simple intuition. So a mean squared error loss looks like a parabola. It penalizes negative errors and positive errors equally, and it penalizes errors more as they get larger because it, it, it's the square. The expectile loss is a kind of tilted parabola where negative weights, ne negative errors, have a different coefficient than positive errors. So if we choose the value of tau here, the multiplier, appropriately, uh, then we can basically penalize negative errors much more than positive errors, which means that it's much better for V of S to be larger than QSI AI than it is for it to be smaller. If we choose a large value of tau, like 0 0.9, for example, then we're penalizing uh, small values of V a lot less than large values. And this gives us uh, something on the upper end of this distribution. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, hang on, our problem all along was that our Q values were turning out to be much larger than they should be. And now we're going to penalize large values a lot less than small values. So isn't that going to exacerbate the problem? Um, but it actually won't because Remember here, we're only using the states and actions in the data set. So we're never going to query Q with any action that was not in the data set, meaning we'll never query Q with any action that it was not trained on. So that already eliminates the overestimation problem completely. In fact, we actually get underestimation because we're not using actions from our learned policy. So by tilting our loss to penalize positive errors a lot less, uh, we actually recover uh, something that is closer to the correct uh, optimal Q function. Formally, it's actually possible to show that what this expectile loss is doing is that it's training the value function to be the maximum of the Q function over all the actions that are within the support of the behavior policy. And the reason that it's doing this for support is that any action that is out of support won't appear in the training set and therefore won't, won't participate in the loss. So essentially, we're, we're regressing to the best action we've seen at states similar to the state. But this is not just as simple as copying the best behavior in the data set, because we're doing this at every state separately. So we're really combining the best things in all the states together, which could result in a final policy that is much better than the very best thing we saw, in uh, the very best trajectory that we saw in the data set. Um, and this is true if you use the expectile loss with a large enough value of tau. Um, 
So this basic principle can be used to devise an algorithm called an implicit Q-learning. This is a very new algorithm. Uh, it only came out uh, a short time ago, but I wanted to tell you about it because it performs quite well. Um, so the principle is that we're going to use this expectile loss. Uh, the theory behind it is that it, ma it, sh it sets the values to be the maximum over the actions for all in-support actions. And uh, practically, uh, this basically corresponds to doing Bellman backups with an implicit policy, which is the argmax policy, but only over those actions that are in support. Um, so now we can actually do value function updates. We get Q functions that are uh, going to be approximating these optimal in support Q functions, but we never have to actually feed in an action into our Q function that it was not trained on, because both losses only ever use uh, states and actions that are in the data set. Um, I'll talk about how well this works later, uh, but before that, I'm, I'm going to talk about an alternative design, uh, and that's actually in the next part of the lecture. Uh, but before I get into that, just to briefly summarize the practical implementation of this approach, uh, essentially, you're going to be alternating between updates to a Q function and updates to a value function. The Q function is updated with mean squared error using the value function as the target, so that's the top left equation. The value function is updated by regressing onto the Q function at all the states and actions in the data set, but using this expectile loss. And that's it. That's how you train the Q function. Now, once you're done with this process, you do need to actually recover a policy from this. Right? There's, no, notice that, that in the Q and V updates, the policy doesn't actually participate explicitly at all. That's why we call this implicit. So once this is all done, this approach does require a separate step to actually ex extract the policy, and that separate step is typically done with something like the advantage-weighted method before. So for that step, we would do something like the um, equation here, uh, the LA loss at the top, but using the Q function trained with this implicit uh, Q-learning approach. 